Jesus heals 10 men with leprosy. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Thank you, brother. You may all be seated. Good morning. We're going to be in the book of John again today. We're beginning John chapter 5. I'd invite you to turn there with me so you can follow along. That's, that's always a good idea to be following along, along in scripture. I'm going to pray for us and, and we'll get into it. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your majesty. I thank you for being a holy God, unlike anything we have ever experienced before, unlike anyone in this world. Our Father, with the world and everything that's taking place in it, we, we do need you. We need you desperately. The world needs you desperately. Our Father, we think about our, our brothers and sisters and the church in Ukraine and in Russia as well. Uh, many praying and I've heard stories of them being rounded up and who knows what happens to them. But Father, in this world where there's persecution of your people all over the place, I pray that we would stand up with them and, and pray alongside them for your will to be accomplished and for your truth to be seen. May your truth be seen in the United States as well. May we be turning our hearts back to you. I pray, Father, that all of us here, myself included, would be willing to open ourselves to you saying, is there anything in my life that you want to take because you're going to provide something better? Is there anything in my life that needs to change to glorify you and honor you as you deserve? I pray that we would be open to that. I thank you for the children who have gone to children's church. May they know you and love you and grow in you. May you encourage the teachers. Uh, Father, uh, same with us. May we know you and grow in you and be yours alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I came across a young man named Warner when as a leader in a campus ministry in college. Now, Warner was an exchange student from Honduras. He had come to the States to get an education and somewhere in the process came across our campus ministry and was attracted to Jesus. We could tell he was touched by the gospel. Apparently, he wanted God in his life, but he refused to commit to receiving Christ when he was given various opportunities. Through further conversation, we learned the reason for his hesitation. Myself and a couple others got together with him, just kind of asked him about it. And he said that politics in Honduras at the time was evidently crooked. I, I don't know if it still is. I don't know anything about poli Honduran politics. But Warder had come to the States to receive an education for the purpose of getting ahead in politics in Honduras to enjoy the good life at the expense of others. He wanted to become a crooked politician to gain all the advantages that came with it. He had been on the other side of that ledger and he wanted to be on the right side from his perspective. And he knew that his plan to enjoy life in this worldly kingdom and what it entailed to do that was inconsistent with how Jesus would call him to live in Jesus' kingdom. He understood that his plans and Jesus' plans for his life were in conflict. 
Amazingly, he told us he would enjoy life the way he planned it, and at the end of his life, he would receive Christ. That way, he would have the salvation. There's all sorts of wrong thinking. I'm not going to even analyze the wrong thinking in that. But he didn't want to miss out on what this world had to offer, so he missed out on Jesus. Somehow he believed the lie that the world had something to offer that was better than Christ. I hope that he has since changed his mind for obvious reasons. Now, in our passage today, we see people missing out on Jesus. Whether it was a person in obvious need of Jesus' touch, an invalid who had been that way for 38 years, or the religious leaders who were mad at him for apparently breaking the Sabbath, at least from their point of view, they didn't realize their need. And I'm not so sure that's so different than what we experience today. Again, please turn with me to John chapter 5. We're going to be starting John chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, where it says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And Jesus had an appointment with one of them this day. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, could you imagine asking this question to someone like that? Do you want to get well? The response is even more amazing. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool or into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. You know, if Jesus asks you if you want to be healed, just say yes. Right? All he had to do was say yes. But I wonder if I'm in kind of the same boat. When I think about sinful patterns in my life and things that are happening, do I just want to say yes to Jesus? Or, or maybe is there a possibility that I don't really want to get well? Well, the need for Jesus here is missed. He somehow overlooked uh, that he basically, this man looks right past Jesus, as we shall see. And this man in, really needed Jesus' touch in his life in a most dramatic way, and probably more than just in the physical. Now, in the book of John, we had last seen Jesus up north in Galilee, now Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's gone back down south for a feast, we are told in our passage. If this passage, passage had said the feast with a definite article, it would be suggest that this was the Passover. But without the definite article, it could refer to any major feast. And it was likely referring to one of the three great feasts that people took a journey to Jerusalem for on a yearly basis. And that would be Passover in the spring, or Pentecost, which would be 50 days later, or the fall feast of tabernacles. And Jesus meets a disabled person by a pool and some covered colonnades. There was some superstitious belief, evidently, that when the waters were stirred by an angel or some moving of God, that the first person in the pool would be healed. And Jesus ignores this superstition altogether. He doesn't even deal with it. He just moves on and gets to the heart of the matter. And he asks what appears to be an insensitive question. In verse 6, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned he had been there and been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? If you think about that question in that situation, that's, that's pretty amazing. Could you imagine asking such a question to somebody who had been in such a situation for a long time? Could you imagine talking to someone in a deathbed of cancer and saying, Hey, do you want to get well? Could you imagine asking a war hero who suffered a disabling injury, do you want to get well? Or maybe a child who with a serious birth defect, you see them and you ask, um, hey, do you want to get well? You now, if I did this, I'd readily be seen as insensitive and it might be considered a dumb question. Did Jesus just ask an insensitive or dumb question? Now, this man had been that way for 38 years, our passage tells us. From what we see in the rest of the passage, Jesus knew something. He knew something. Perhaps this man had become comfortable in this bad situation. After all, it's all he knew about for as long as he could probably remember. He appeared to be comfortable and complacent in his situation. As a matter of fact, as we're going to see later in the passage, he's suggesting that Jesus suggests that this might have been caused due to sin. He said, he told him to stop sinning or something worse could befall you. I wonder, are we really that different? Do we want to get well? Are we comfortable in our sin? 
Do we understand our need for Jesus in a given situation? Do we, need, do we understand our need for God to intervene into our lives? Do we hold on to our sin out of com comfort because really it's all we know? We know there's something wrong, but we hold on to what we have when our Heavenly Father is saying, I want to give you something better. Do we want to get well? There's a story of a little girl who had a cheap, fake pearl necklace, and she had it for years and did everything with it. She even slept with these pearls, but they were cheap plastic pearls, and they had become faded, stained, and discolored. Some of the plastic pearls were broken off uh, and were kind of like crumbly, and some were missing. You can kind of picture it. It's kind of an eyesore. But they were her pearls, and she did not want to give them up. Her dad came to her one evening and said, these pearls are stained, uh, they're discolored, they're broken off. This isn't what I want for my little girl. This isn't what's befitting my little girl. Would you give them to me, please? She said, no, Daddy, no. I can't give you my pearls. I can't give you my pearls. And she clutched to them. From time to time, he'd come back and he'd say, you're my little girl and I, I love you. And these aren't befitting you. They're discolored, they're broken. They're not befitting my little girl. Would you give them to me? And, no, Daddy, no, I can't give you my pearls. Finally, one night, he came in and he gave that same speech. He said, hey, they're discolored, they're broken. They're not what's best for you. They're not befitting my little girl. Would you please give these pearls to your daddy? And with tears in her eyes, she took them and she gave them to him and she started weeping. Then her dad pulled out real pearls worth great value and gave them to her. He was just waiting to give her something of true value, something that was good, but she had to give up the junk first. So often we hang on to what we are comfortable with when our Father wants to give us something better. We hold on to the junk because we really don't want to get well. We hold on to sinful patterns and choices that are not fitting a child of God, but it's what we know. Maybe it's what we're comfortable with. We ignore the healing touch of Jesus who wants to give us something so much better. Somehow we look right past Jesus and right past our need. The man in our passage answers Jesus' question with an excuse. In verse 7, he says, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Again, all he had to do was say, yes. That's all he had to do. Maybe he didn't understand he was talking to. We've seen the rest of the passage. He didn't understand it was Jesus. He didn't understand what Jesus could do. I sometimes wonder if I really understand myself. Maybe he was comfortable in his condition. If he were healed, changes would need to be made. Sometimes we don't want to make those changes. And somehow this man looked right past Jesus. And we can marvel at him, but do we do the same thing? Are we comfortable in our condition when Jesus wants to give us something better? And he says, give me that junk so I can give you what I really intend for you. Do we understand our need for Jesus and for what only he can provide? And like I said, sometimes I honestly wonder about me. One of the things God constantly seems to be working on in my life is the idea that I should be still and know that he is God. Psalm 4610 says, be still or cease striving and know that I am God. And sometimes I prefer to take things on in my own power and run around like a chicken with my head cut off. I choose that. Why do I do that? Is it because I don't trust him? Is it because I'm prideful? Is it because I'm so worldly thinking that in the moment I, I, I don't stop and think about maybe I should give this to God? Now, I'm sure I have my excuses. What is your excuse? How do you justify a besetting sinful pattern that you know is not befitting a child of God? Is there something you're comfortable with that is really not okay? Maybe it's not something big. Right in the church, we have all these big things, you know, that you're supposed to try to wander through. But maybe it's just complacency about Jesus. Maybe you have Jesus right in front of you, but you don't understand your need, and you look right past him. We want our Jesus a little watered down, don't we? Now, I notice when I go to Starbucks and I hear people order coffee, I'm not a coffee drinker, I get like hot chocolate or apple cider or something. When I hear people order coffee, I realize they don't really want coffee either. 
Because I'll hear these people order, and it's like, I want a shot of this and a shot of that and a ton of sugar and put as much cream in it as you possibly can or whatever can to make this horrible stuff actually taste good. Because from my point of view, coffee is nasty. Now, I know I'm talking to people in the Pacific Northwest, and this is probably extremely offensive. But I just think that stuff is absolutely is, is just nasty. I mean, it's, it, I don't know why anybody would drink it. But, and I've noticed that few people want it straight. How many of you, I know there's going to be quite a few, but how many of you like your, your coffee just black with nothing else in it? It's the Pacific Northwest. Of course there's some of you. I'm praying for you. I just want you to know. <laughs> but few people actually want their coffee just straight. They want things added in. Well, sometimes we don't like Jesus unfiltered either. We want Jesus watered down or things of the world added in, things put in because we don't want Jesus just, we don't want that much of Jesus. And we look right past him when there's a need because maybe we don't want to get well. Well, Jesus heals this man physically, but he still has a greater need than the physical healing. In John 5, 8 to 9, it says, And Jesus said to him, Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. I love that Jesus doesn't hear the excuse. He gets right to the point. Tell you what, take up that mat, mat and walk. Amazingly, no faith was required of this man in this situation. This was all Jesus. This was grace through and through. Do you ever receive a blessing that you did not deserve or even ask for? Maybe it happens all the time. Stephen Alford wrote of a Baptist pastor named Peter Miller, who lived in Ephrata, Pennsylvania during the American Revolution. He was also a friend of George Washington. In Ephrata also lived Michael Whitman, an enemy of the pastor, a fairly foul individual who did all he could to oppose and humiliate him. One day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to die. Peter Miller traveled 70 miles on foot to Philadelphia to plead for the life of his enemy. No, Peter, General Washington said, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. My friend, exclaimed the old preacher, he's my most bitter enemy. What, cried Washington, you've walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. I'll grant you your pardon. Michael Whitman deserved death. He did not ask for a pardon, nor did he deserve one. But he received one anyway. That's grace. Jesus had just shown that kind of grace to, in the life of this disabled man in our passage. He shows that grace, I think, all the time. In fact, his undeserved grace falls on unbelievers and believers alike. In Matthew 5, 45, Jesus is talking, and he says, My father lets his son and rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. He gives us good things and provides for us all the time, none of which is deserved. I don't deserve the next breath that I'm going to take, and yet I take it for granted. But the greater need is salvation. It is to know him. It is receiving that abundant grace for our eternities that is the greatest need of all. Trusting in the work of the cross. He hadn't gone to the cross yet for this man of the passage, but he has for us. Yet many people refuse. They look right past Jesus and they ignore their need. The disabled man had been cured, but he still needed healing. He had a greater need. He was a man in need of a savior, and he's no different than any of us. He needed Jesus. My, Warren, my friend Warner from Honduras, I mentioned earlier, need Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. Everyone does need Jesus. He is the savior for a reason. Now, the confrontation Jesus had with the religious leaders that we see next reveals their need as well. And we see that in John 5, 9 to 18. It says, the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? I think they knew it was Jesus. They were looking for a chance to kill him, as we see later in the passage. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him. I love that. He goes to the temple and he finds him. It says, Later Jesus found him at the temple. And said to him, see you are well again. Stop sitting, suggesting the sitting was taking place. Stop sitting or something worse may, be, may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Why would he do that? Why didn't, why didn't he fall at Jesus' feet and just thank him? 
So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. They're already trying to kill him. Now they're trying to kill him all the more. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Yes, he was doing that. Now Jesus asked this man to take up his mat and walk on the Sabbath. He could have just said, you're healed, be free, or whatever, but he said, take up your mat and walk. And he may have intentionally been challenging the hypocrisy of the religious elite. The religious leaders didn't understand their own need, and Jesus is confronting them with that. And the law said not to work on the Sabbath, and the law came with serious consequences. In Exodus 31, verse 14, it says, Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. Those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. So there's some pretty serious consequences here. So these leaders took the intent of the law, which was designed to protect the holiness of the Sabbath, and they came up with 39 classes of work, the human additions to the law, the last of which was a prohibition against carrying a load from one place to another. This was a legalistic perversion of the biblical intent. Our goal is to be biblical. It's not to be liberal. It's not to be conservative or anything else we want to say. We want to be biblical. We don't want to add and we don't want to subtract. Now, I think in a lot of liberal circles, it's more likely that they're going to subtract. They don't understand the holiness of Jesus. They don't understand the seriousness of sin. So maybe they subtract. In more conservative circles, we might need to be careful because we may have a tendency to add, right? We want to add rules. We want to help God in his righteousness, I guess. I, I think I tend to be that way a little bit. When we were trying to get a youth group started years ago, for those who don't know the history here, not that I'm going to give a long history, but we had a time when there wasn't very many people at all and almost no children and, and no youth. And I was trying to start a youth group, and I asked a couple of young guys frequently to come to the youth group, and they weren't coming, they weren't coming. And this one night that they came, and I don't think they were believers, and they came through the doors of the church, and they were both wearing hats. Now, I saw them from the corner, and I didn't think I wasn't thinking anything of that. I'm just glad they're there, right? So I'm, I'm coming up to thank them for coming to the church. And from this back room here, someone saw them. I didn't know they were there. And they came out, and this lady let them have it. How dare you come to this place and put your hats on? And she just, she just chewed them out. Good. I was horrified. I apologized, which made her angry. And what do you think happened? Yeah. Yeah, they didn't come back. On another occasion, we were doing games in the gym. A few of the students went to the restroom, but they ran to get there. And we used to have a water drinking fountain. I think a lot of them were drinking, going to the drinking fountain. It's down the hall. There wasn't a lot of people. There was no danger of any kind. But someone saw them running, and she reamed them good. You children shouldn't be running in the church. Don't you understand? She just went this whole thing. The Lord is holy, and this place is holy. And, and she just chewed them out good. And afterwards, I said, why, why did you do that? Oh, she was proud of it. Let them have it. It's the way it should be, Pastor. And I said, next time you want to yell at somebody, yell at me. I'm the leader. I let them run. I didn't have a problem with that. I kind of thought of the passage, you know, let the little children come unto me. So yell at me next time. And what do you think happened? Some of those kids were deeply hurt and didn't come back. And since it's costing us the cause of the gospel, my one question is, where is it in here? Where is it in here? You know, a lot of people say they can identify with different people, uh, Thomas and doubting and Peter and putting his foot in his mouth or whatever it might be. And I can relate at times too. But the ones I relate to most in scripture are the Pharisees. I make a good Pharisee. I can find the speck in your eye while I have a log in my own as good as any of them. And I can come up with different rules for you and different things that I want to add to make your life as miserable as possible. I can be pretty good at that. I can do that very, very well. But in doing that, I miss the most important thing, don't I? Well, the Pharisees here missed out on what was most important. Jesus was standing right in front of them and they looked right past him and didn't see their own need. The healed man in our passage may also have missed out on what was most important. Verse 11, 
he blamed Jesus for breaking the Sabbath. Now, this may have been an evasive tactic. After all, the death penalty was possibly on the line. And he may, may have had better motives. Some people say, you know, well, who told you to, you know, he said, well, the person who healed me said, pick up your mat and walk. And some people think, well, he might have been focusing on the healing part. Did you hear that he was healed? He healed me, and he said this. So some people say, well, maybe we can give him a pass. But in verse 13, we see that he didn't bother to know who had healed him. Does he, appear to, he appears to be indifferent to Jesus, even after Jesus had healed him. In verse 15, this man sells Jesus out to the authorities after Jesus sought him out. And we never see him saying thankful. We never see him falling at his feet. Was he just protecting his self-interests? He appears to be very self-absorbed and possibly narcissistic. He looked right past Jesus to his own interest and missed the creator of the universe who had healed him and sought him out and showed him incredible grace. He does not appear to give Jesus a second glance. And I understand that one because I think that I tend to be a little narcissistic too. Sometimes I take an evaluation of my thoughts at the end of the day. It's a healthy thing they say to do. And when I think about what I thought about most, you know what it always is? Me. I thought about me most of the time. Because I tend to be a little narcissistic. What this man needed was spiritual healing. He needed Jesus more than he needed to walk. And Jesus told him to stop sinning or something worse could befall him. Were sin and the disease connected in this case? We know that's not always the case. We know elsewhere in John that someone was born blind. The disciples came to Jesus and said, who was born blind, this man or his parents? Or who has who sinned? Said he was born blind, this man or the parents? And Jesus said, neither. This is demonstrate the glory of God. But here he says, stop sinning implying it was happening or something worse may befall you, maybe connecting the sin with disease. It's, it's hard to say for sure, but... And it could be that the something worse could be from an eternal perspective. But he had Jesus right in front of him, seeking him out. But he did not appear to be very thankful. Jesus was right in front of him, but he looked right past him and missed his need. Compare that attitude with that of the leper Jesus had healed, which Tom, the passage that Tom had read from earlier in Luke chapter 17, verse 15 to 16. It says, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. One out of ten comes back, and Jesus was pleased with this, and he threw himself at his feet. He thanks him. We don't say anything like that with the invalid in our passage. Well, the religious leaders were no better off. They also had Jesus right in front of them, but they couldn't see their need because of their self-righteousness. They had hard hearts. They were responsible for the spiritual direction of the nation, but they were not moved by this healing. They had no compassion. They had no understanding. They were bad shepherds. They should be rejoicing. This guy had been this way for 38 years, and he's healed. He's freed. Let's throw a party. No, no. Because God, in the flesh, had broken one of their rules. And that's not okay. Compare that lack of compassion to Jesus' compassion as the good shepherd. In Matthew 9, verse 35 to 36, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So there's what the Pharisees saw when they saw the crowds of hurting people. And there's what Jesus saw when he saw the crowds of hurting people. Jesus had compassion. He wanted to heal and he wanted to meet the need. The Pharisees saw something completely different. And in John 10, 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's a good shepherd. The Pharisees were not. The religious leaders then persecute Jesus. Legalistic human rules had blinded them. And of course, Jesus made the claim to be God, and they didn't like that either. In John 5, 18, it says, For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. I like that. It's like, we're always trying to kill you. Now we're real serious. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath. That's an interesting statement to me, because they actually put him in that category. He wasn't. He was breaking man-made rules. But to them, their man-made rules made no difference than what Scripture said. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Yes, he was. And if Jesus was not God, they were right, perhaps, to have some concerns. 
But his heritage, his claims, his actions, and his works all lined up with prophecy and the coming of the Messiah and Lord. And he had just healed an invalid, right? You know, Jesus wants everyone to make a decision about who he is. That is his intention. He wanted the disabled man to make a decision. He wanted the religious leaders to make a decision. The disabled man, we don't really know what the decision is when it ends. There's some lack of clarity. But with the, relig with the religious leaders, oh, there was clarity on their decision. He wanted his disciples to make a decision. He wanted the crowds to make a decision. He wants you to make a decision. And once we do make a decision for Jesus, we could be persecuted for our claim about Christ as well. But everyone will eventually confess the truth of who Jesus is. It's just better to do so now. Someday those Pharisees will confess the truth of who Jesus is. Someday that invalid will confess the truth of who Jesus is. And someday everyone in this room and everyone watching online and everyone on this globe is going to make a confession about who Jesus is. In Philippians 2, 9-11, it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Or every knee should bow and in heaven and earth and under the earth every tongue acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so my question is, when it says that at the name of Jesus, how many knees should bow? And how many tongues are going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord? Everyone. The question before us is, when will we bow? When will we confess? And what will be our conviction when we do so? Or another way to ask that question is, do you want to get well? Will you look at Jesus or will you look right past him? And there's a couple of things that are important as we close. One is if you're an unbeliever, if you're online or you're here and you have yet to put your faith in Jesus, well, this refers really to, to your salvation. Do you want to get well? Do, do, do you want to have someone cover your sin, what Jesus did on the cross? Do you want to get well? Do you want to be in a relationship? Do you want healing? Do you want to become spiritually alive? Do you want to get well? But there's also a subset you could look at here for, for people who are believers. Are there things that you're holding on to as a believer, you're confessing Christ, but you know it doesn't fit. You know it's not fitting someone who professes Christ. And you don't want to give it up. You don't want to give up the junk because you love the junk. And meanwhile, God's saying, give up the junk because I have something so much better in mind for you than that junk. What junk are we holding on to? What junk might you be holding on to that perhaps God's saying, I want you to give that up because I've got something so much better. Do we believe him? Now, if you're here, you're online, and you've yet to receive Christ as your Savior and your Lord, if you've yet to do that, this is critically important because that's the starting point. And the question, do you want to get well? God created us to be in a relationship with him. He created you to be in a relationship with him. He wants that oneness of relationship with you. But there is a problem our sin separates us from a holy God who has nothing to do with sin. It's an abomination to him. It's complete rebellion against everything that he considers true and dear. And then there's the mistake people make, right? That they think they can pay for it on their own. Sin cannot be removed. It cannot be paid for by you or by me. It took a savior. It took a perfect representative who lived a perfect life to die in our place so that he would die for our sin and we would take on his righteousness. And this is something that Jesus, that's what he came to do. And paying for our sin on the cross, he died and he rose again. That everyone who puts their faith and their trust in him has eternal life. Life that begins now and lasts forever. And if you have yet to put your faith and trust in Jesus, you've yet to receive him personally as your savior, I'm going to invite you for the opportunity, I'm going to pray. You can pray on your own. You don't need me to pray with you, but I'm going to pray. And if God prompts you, pray along with me in your heart to say, yes, Jesus. Do you want to get well? Yes. And if that's your heart's desire, pray along with me right now. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place, for dying for my sin on the cross. 
Thank you for shedding your blood for me. I receive your work on the cross. I receive you as my Savior. And I trust you that today I'm your child and I always will be. And I trust you that you will indwell me with the Holy Spirit and you will help me to be more like you each and every day as I get well in every area of my life. And this I pray in your name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.